Rajam. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm, it's nice to be with Dr. Rajni also. And just to cl uh, clarify a bit, uh, Dr. Rajni and me will kind of split the session and try to finish it within 50 minutes. I think listening to more than 30, 40 minutes of a didactic lecture can be a bit boring. At the same time, I know all of you have had some basic training in palliative care, if not more, all, and also already working in palliative care for many years. So let this be an interactive session. So it will be interesting for you and me. So I can learn from you and you can learn from me. And uh, both me and Rajni are new in the, uh, you know, in the area of palliative care. So there's lots that we can learn from all of you. Um, so Rajni will keep an eye on the chat when I'm chatting. Please keep let the suggestions and the questions and everything come in. Uh, just I'm just going to share my screen. And if there's any pressing questions uh, and if you want to talk about it, we can discuss towards the end. So like um, uh, Gauraya described that I was, I'm a pulmonologist working in Mumbai. And I think today we are going to talk about the respiratory illnesses and the palliative approach. And a lot of this, I'm sure you've already known, but let me start by saying uh, this very important uh, quote, which says the needs of the people at the end of life are very similar, irrespective of the underlying life limiting illness. Now, I thought it was very important for me to actually um, put this as a first slide because in my four or four and a half years as a palliative care physician and a pulmonologist, I have struggled in the initial stages and there are days even now to convince people, pulmonologists, colleagues, juniors and seniors, the need for palliative care and respiratory medicine. I know I'm already talking to a converted lot and you all know that there is importance of um, palliative care in respiratory illnesses, but we ha I have struggled to try and convince people that irrespective of the cause of any chronic illness, uh, patients do require and really benefit patients and caregivers with palliative care. And this is just to highlight, uh, I have put this graph here, which shows that you all must have already seen it. But I just wanted to quickly run past that most of our organ failure patients fit into graph C, where they live a prolonged period of time with very high symptom burden and their only point of contact with the doctors in the hospital and hospital consultants are during the acute emergencies. But with every acute emergency, which could have been an imminent death, when they actually go back home, they have poorer and poorer quality of life and they depend more and more on their family and loved ones, which is the reason that it is extremely important to remember that all chronic illnesses irrespective of the diagnosis and the prognosis require palliative care and respiratory medicine is no exception. It has to be a need-based assessment and therefore uh, encouraging more and more hospital consultants and doctors to refer patients to any of any specialty to palliative care. And also coming to why palliative care uh, and why in respiratory medicine. So if you see the statistics of in, in India, uh, and the non-communicable diseases. So we do add 1 million new cancer patients every year to our existing list. And we do add a lot of them in an advanced stage. But if you see this little uh, um, uh, statistics, it shows that life limiting illnesses, chronic lifestyle diseases like diabetes, heart disease, stroke, respiratory conditions, form a big chunk of Indians who are affected by it. And these are the conditions which we are not able to cure. We are not, we are only able to control. And a lot of these is incurable. So in respiratory diseases, especially smoking related asthma, they do, do form a big chunk of Indians affected by it. And therefore it is very important to handhold both patients and caregivers during this difficult journey. And it, there are these are two worlds which can work parallelly and which are parallel but can work side by side because there's a huge impact of advanced diseases and chronic diseases in the, in the life of patients and caregivers. So it's very important for us to realize that even statistics show that non-communicable diseases are on a rise, especially in India, lifestyle diseases, and therefore more and more patients live with more and more prolonged high head symptom burden for a long period of time. 
and india has 18% of the world's population but unfortunately it has one third of the burden of the chronic respiratory illnesses so there is a lot of volume of patients affected by chronic respiratory illness and the covid pandemic has only made it worse so we will talk about it towards the end because i think it's important to address covid also because that's one of the illnesses that has really impacted the life of pulmonologists obviously the patients caregivers and palliative care physicians so it is important because the main symptom of respiratory diseases is chronic breathlessness and this results in social isolation and in some people have actually described patients dying socially before a physical death there is a difficulty in activities of daily living so they have very poor quality of life and in turn they also end up with poor quality of death when there is not an intervention with palliative care so what conditions are we talking about if we generally talk about if you broadly divide it it's airway diseases like asthma copd bronchiectasis which none of them are curable you can keep them under control and they will advance and when we are talking about palliative care interventions it is advanced stages of these airway diseases parenchymal conditions in the lung like interstitial lung disease it's a huge umbrella of various causes covid pneumonia being one of them so this is where there is a problem in the lung parenchyma and patients have start with dry cough and progressively short of breath and actually interstitial lung disease especially a certain kind called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can be compared to certain forms of cancer because their lifespan is between 2 and 1/2 to 4 to 5 years and there isn't any proper medical treatment to cure it the only way out of a progressive pulmonary fibrosis is lung transplant which is very very nascent in our country and it is still in its infancy then there are other conditions like vascular conditions like primary pulmonary hypertension also secondary pulmonary hypertension due to airway and parenchymal diseases pulmonary embolism not the acute kind but the chronic pulmonary embolism which we call as cteph is also a thing that will require palliative care the other issues we must not forget is effusions due to malignancy which can be recurrently filling and distressing infections which we as doctors have made it more complex by having multi drug resistant tuberculosis and extremely drug resistant tuberculosis and now we have covid to add the list so very often pulmonologists struggle saying when should we refer to palliative care talking about palliative care to patients means giving up or is it that i am losing hope with the patients and one of the very interested interesting questions researched is will you be surprised if the patient is not alive in the next one year this is the question which has been researched in england and this is a very important starting point for patients uh, for doctors primary caregivers to actually start thinking of palliative care because if you are not going to be surprised that this patient will not be alive in the next one year that is the time to start the discussions and start pro proactive palliative care and just to help you with the indications and the indicators there are these two beautiful documents one made by manipal uh, in uh, kasturba uh, medical college uh, in manipal which is called the blue maple which is easily downloadable and also the gold standard framework both both these documents give you exact indicators in every chronic illness in every organ and every system when you should start the interact uh, proactive palliative care and to give you a little indicator of when is ideal time to start in a respiratory patient it's at least two of these following points obviously advancing age but that patient who's had recurrent hospital admissions a pft which shows steady decline A patient who is not able to walk hundred meters without uh, shortness of breath or extremely distressed, or those patients on continuous oxygen or some kind of non-invasive ventilation, symptoms of right heart failure and other comorbidities. So patients need to fit into any of these two criteria for the pulmonologist or the primary caregiver to refer to proactive palliative care. And with this, what we benefit as palliative care physicians is that we can integrate. palliative care into all specialties we get the time to form the rapport patient doesn't feel abandoned and there is enough time to discuss with caregivers family across the world and 
and have a detailed plan of not just improving the quality of life, but also planning goals of care and improving the quality of death of these patients. So one of the very important things that has happened in the world of palliative care is to actually define chronic breathlessness syndrome. A lot of work has been done by Dr. Miriam Johnson and David Caro, and they have written a lot of papers about what is chronic breathlessness syndrome. And today I'll be happy if you all if all of you can take away this one good uh, message of identifying chronic breathlessness syndrome, acknowledging that with your patients and helping them to try and overcome it. So this is what we will be doing today. So by definition, chronic breathlessness syndrome is that patient who, despite being on optimum medical treatment for his underlying pathophysiology, whatever that may be, continues to feel short of breath. And this shortness of breath is actually impacting his activities of daily life, adversely affecting his psychosocial health. And the duration of this is not important. Imagine these patients being chronically breathless every single minute, 24 hours a day, day after day. So it's not important whether it's one day, one week, one month or five years. What is important is how we could improve this quality of life of these patients who are on maximum medical treatment for their underlying condition and still feel breathless. So there was an acknowledgement from the Global Initiative of Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, which we call it as GOLD, which is a body which actually talks and deals and focuses a lot on the COPD. And very often they, they also have come up in their guidelines that despite receiving optimal, optimal medical therapy, there are patients who experience distressing breathlessness. They're not able to do activities of daily living because of impaired exercise capacity. They, uh, you know, they experience fatigue, uh, insomnia, depression, and these things can be included, that can be improved by actually integrating palliative care therapies because palliative care expands traditional disease based model meant to increase the functioning of the patient and to improve the quality of life and optimizing what he enjoys doing and gets pleasure out of in daily life. And not just the patient, that is the beauty of palliative care. It's the caregiver who also go through a lot when you have a patient with a chronic lung disease and in, in an advanced stage. So the magnitude of the problem is something that really does hit us because annually there is been almost 75 million people who suffer and they're not just respiratory causes and contribution to chronic breathlessness. Most of it, yes, is respiratory, but including incurable cancers with anorexia cachexia syndrome, with deconditioning, they also experience a lot of breathlessness and obviously cardiac illnesses in the advanced stages also experience. So in short, it is all, all your advanced chronic obstructive lung diseases, interstitial lung diseases, congestive cardiac failure, neuromuscular conditions, which actually hamper the activity of the diaphragm, anything with like advanced lung cancer and also anorexia cachexia syndrome. Just to let you know that the cardiologists, when they grade um, the, this breathlessness, they use class one to class four, while we in respiratory physicians, we assess the severity using the modified medical research council dyspnea scale. And this ranges from zero to four. This slides will be available to you. So there's you know, no need to go through this in detail, but zero being and the patient is breathless on very <clears throat> strenuous exercise and grade four when the patient is too breathless to leave the house or even breathless in doing simple activities of daily living. So when you have a patient of breathlessness and you have assessed the patient and you have actually graded the patient upon the severity, what things you really need to do to investigate is obviously a clinical examination, a chest x-ray, ECG is basic but you need to have a lung function test, a computerized lung function test, which has become a little bit of a difficult time during the COVID pandemic because it's a blowing test, but it's important to have a complete lung function test with a bronchodilator reversibility and also a diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide to see the how much of the air is oxygen is get able to diffuse in the lung because of the lung parenchymal issues. And a very important test is a six minute walk test, wherein we can pick up desaturation because of advanced lung diseases. And these patients will benefit with supplemental oxygen therapy. A high resolution CT scan and arterial blood gas should also be a part of your uh, investigation as a baseline. And also, if you do a blood gas, you get to know whether the patient is type one rest 
respiratory failure with normal carbon dioxide or type 2 respiratory failure with an elevated carbon dioxide. So this is the basic investigations that you need to do when you have a patient who is breathless. The importance of actually focusing and identifying chronic breathlessness is very often non-communicable diseases are not perceived as life limiting. Whenever you diagnose a patient to have cancer, there is a constant reminder of mortality. It is not so when a patient is diagnosed to have COPD or bronchiectasis or even pulmonary hypertension. It's also because pulmonologists don't convey that diagnosis in such a manner. Plus, these patients live a very prolonged period of life with a high symptom burden and they keep thinking that every admission, they're going to get some treatment to become better. So please remember that it is our duty to explain, communicate in a manner that they understand that they are receiving symptomatic treatment. It is not a permanent cure for their underlying disease. So it's extremely important more in non-communicable diseases. And when I talk about communication, it is how we take the history for patients with advanced lung diseases. Very often we either ask the patient, is your breathlessness better or are you breathless? Now, in an Indian setting, the patient is very intimidated as it is by doctors and does not want to upset the doctors. Framing the questions in this manner automatically makes corners the patient and he wants to be, um, wants to keep that consultation in a happy frame of mind. If you rephrase the same question, so it's like, for example, are you coping with your breathlessness or is the breathlessness affecting your daily life? Or this is another way of asking, have you had to give up something because of your breathlessness? I'm sure if you ask the question in this manner, the amount of issues that you can actually generate out of that patient can be very different as against if you just ask the patient, are you breathless? So it's very important for us to re realize how we frame our questions and what we can elicit depending on depends on the way we ask our questions and uh, just a simple graph to show you the community burden of elderly adults living with serious illnesses shortness of breath is so high on the list and this can occur not just with copd yes copd form the bulk but a lot of patients with congestive heart failure and a lot of patients with cancer but please remember one of the main domains of Reporting to OPD is shortness of breath. And this graph is to highlight to you that with the sharp decline in the physical health of patients with COPD or chronic with chronic breathlessness, there's a sharp decline in the mental component also. So a lack of depend uh, lack of independence uh, unable to do pally uh, unable to do activities of daily living on their own being housebound bed bound on oxygen and slowly getting deconditioned is a real cause of depression uh, you know insomnia worthlessness loss of role anxiety frustration so it's very important to not just include physical symptoms in your follow up for pulmonologists this is the reason that they need to integrate palliative care with respiratory medicine. And this brings me to the basic of this talk today, which is the breathing, thinking, functioning model. And if you see a patient who is chronically breathless, like I said, day after day, month, week after week, that patient is obviously having increased work of breathing, is using his accessory muscles of respiration and more and more getting tired. And with this increased respiratory rate, his mind is the most active and he feels useless, he's angry, he's frustrated and the anxiety can worsen the breathlessness. And because of this enhanced state of extreme breathlessness, he walks and does even more less. So what happens is if you, the basically he loses his muscles and this is where the patient ends up having deconditioning. Therefore, the, our patients with chronic advanced lung diseases are actually stuck in this vicious cycle where they are very breathless because of their underlying lung pathology. Then they get very anxious because they're so breathless. And both this together lets, leads them to do less and less and they become more and more deconditioned. So this is exactly where palliative care along with respiratory medicine can actually help break the vicious cycle by giving the patient proper medications by his pulmonologist, optimum treatment, we can involve counselors, psychiatrists to see to it that his anxiety, anger, depression, frustration is under control. 
and we have supervised graded physiotherapy by respiratory physiotherapist to improve his muscle conditioning so that he's able to do little bit of activity with the existing lung capacity so we overall we try to improve the quality of life by breaking this vicious cycle and that is very important to recognize that we doctors really need to focus beyond the physical symptoms we need to focus beyond what is exactly happening to our patients with chronic breathlessness so what do we know till now that it causes immense suffering over a long period of time and a lot of patients are affected it is under recognized and under treated we have limited options to relieve the suffering that we have described so well and it's still in its infancy but it definitely exists and once we actually try and find out how many of our opd patients are in this we can really try to address and change and improve their quality of life so what do we want to do as respiratory palliative care physicians we really want to improve their quality of life and also focus at end of life because these patients who live with a chronic illness which is incurable they should have detailed discussions of goals of care and an advanced care planning to have a good quality of death and during their life we need to aggressively control symptoms we need to prepare patients and caregivers for death and also involve them shared decision making and see to it that it's a person centered care and the person is treated holistically so this is how a rough idea which has been proposed by canadian thoracic society where depending on the severity of the copd where you could include the treatment for chronic breathlessness so you obviously start with initially and the pharmacological treatment which is inhalers which are short acting bronchodilators long acting bronchodilators you have uh, uh, ipratropium bromide you have triatropium bromide you have oral bronchodilators you also initiate physiotherapy pulmonary rehab after a particular point there is very strong evidence that supports the use of low dose oral morphine so oral opioids in the management of chronic breathlessness so i will just come to that before that there's a very important aspect which i learned in uh, palliative care only in the past 4 years which is the non pharmacological interventions and how beneficial they are in managing the symptom of chronic breathlessness so whenever you have a patient who is already on all these medications doing the pulmonary rehab and still continues to be breathless low mood etc we need to think laterally we need to explore the beliefs and anxiety of the patient like i said we need to start teaching him relaxation techniques we need to involve the counselor the physiotherapist and a very interesting fact that has been published and very well researched in the by the hull uh, palliative care team is the fan blowing on the face so there if a patient gets acutely breathless a patient with chronic advanced lung disease the positioning of the patient near the window loose clothes and a fast blowing fan on the face really helps the patient relieve the sense of dyspnea so these are simple things that caregivers can do that caregivers can be educated and empowered so that they don't panic and they also feel a sense of uh, the care that they are offering to the patient so extremely important to please try the non pharmacological uh therapies before you actually venture to the pharmacological now all of you know that in an acute attack we do give nebulizers uh, through the we give bronchodilators and steroids uh, through the nebulizer if there's an infection you treat it with antibiotics for an acute exacerbation there is a role of steroids also we also use non invasive ventilation most important thing to remember here is the oxygen that we use is also a drug the need for oxygen should be when this oxygen saturation is below 88 all patients who have a saturation below 88 will benefit with oxygen therapy please don't initiate oxygen even if the oxygen saturation is 95 because that also causes lung damage so there could be other reasons why the patient is having breathlessness one of which could be anxiety it could be a panic attack so a lot of this has to be explored before you just start the patient on oxygen but patients will benefit with oxygen if the oxygen is less than 88 and in advanced lung diseases we try and maintain the oxygen between 88 and 92 for optimum function of the other organs in the body
So when we talk of non-invasive ventilation, that is the maximum we go for maximum ward care of these patients in an acute attack. And this is the reason why we need to have conversations and dialogues with the patient, the family, much before they come in an acute event so that we can form a rapport, we have the goals of care, and we also discuss the futility of invasive aggressive treatment. Because patients with weak lungs, patients with advanced chronic respiratory do very poorly on ventilator. So this is the whole discussion of withholding care or not escalating care in these patients. So it's very important for us to have early referrals. And there has been enough refer uh, evidence to suggest early referral really improves the quality of life of patients as well as the caregivers and, and the doctors. So we do, we use low dose morphine for patients who are chronically breathless and at home. We uh, currently, we use oral morphine and in Bombay we have immediate release so we use a very small dose of 2.5 milligrams twice a day and slowly increase it weekly with a weekly review and we always prescribe it with laxatives and we see to it that patient reports to us a feeling that his breathlessness sensation has improved to increase the dose of morphine. In breathlessness we do not go beyond 30 milligrams but very very often, even small doses of morphine way below 30 makes a very drastic difference in the quality of life of patients. Yes, there is a lot of opioid phobia amongst patients, caregivers and doctors to prescribe the morphine, but it is a wonder drug. It helps to improve the quality of the patients very dramatically and they're able to enjoy small pleasures of life. So if my patient who's housebound, bed bound on oxygen can actually walk to the toilet without support or eat a meal with this family, that is a big deal for them. And that is what we aim to improve in palliative care. We not not just improve his physical condition, but also his emotional, psychological, and, and uh, f uh, spiritual. So it's very important for us to address what is important for that patient. And morphine seems to do that very, very well. So we start very low, low dose morphine. And we can also give this morphine subcutaneous in patients who are very acutely ill or not able to swallow. And if the doses are IV morphine, then obviously the dose is halved compared to the subcute. And when the uh, breathlessness is worsened by anxiety, we include a medium, medium acting benzodiazepine. And when it is associated with panic, we then give a longer acting benzodiazepine. So assessment evaluation is very important. History taking is very important. Please continue the regular optimal treatment that the patient is on for his underlying condition, but a low dose morphine in addition, along with midazolam, if there is anxiety, will really benefit the patient and patients end up living a good quality of life. And there is evidence to suggest that even they improve the quantity of life, but it's important to improve the quality of life. So it is in what, this was a study which was published in the an Annals of American Thoracic Society, where it clearly showed a nine millimeter improvement on the visual analog scale with and without morphine. So please remember that it really benefits patients with chronic breathlessness. And unlike what most respiratory physicians think, the morphine does not cause respiratory depression in the doses we use. And the mantra being start low, go slow. And it does not cause type 2 respiratory failure, which is worsening of the carbon dioxide. And one small note on terminal breathlessness, which is very common in patients uh, who are about, uh, about I mean, uh, actively dying, and not just respiratory patients, it could be cancer, CCF, or even patients with post-stroke, renal. And it's important in such situations to identify the active dying phase and end of life and make the patient comfortable after proper communication and documentation with patient if possible and with relatives to, and to see to it that you could start a 24-hour infusion with a combination of morphine and midazolam given through the subcutaneous route to cause relief of symptoms. The intent is comfort. The intent is not respiratory depression or the intent is not to kill. So the doses are very small. They're given subcutaneously and they go over 24 hours. And then this is reviewed and you can increase the dose every 24 hours depending on the symptoms of the patient. So the intent is comfort and aggressively comfort the patient and relieve of his distressing symptoms. 
So that was about breathlessness. I'm just going to speak about two or three more symptoms before I hand over to Rajni. I uh, appreciate the time is half past seven. So another big point that we face in chest medicine is respiratory secretions. Post-stroke, very often there are patients with a lot of secretions, pneumonia, bronchiectasis, and very often in neurological conditions, we see that patients get suction. And that can be an extremely uncomfortable experience and the, uh, the, the, the state of the oropharynx can be very, very uh, inflamed and traumatized. So one of the approaches that we do in, in palliative care is to decrease the secretions. So the medications available to decrease the secretions are hyoscine, hydrobromide, versus glycopyrrolate. We can use either of these in doses, which are like point, point 0.2 to point 0.4 glycopyrrolate or 2 to 4, uh, 20 to 40 hyoscine. Please use it on need basis. Extremely drying up the secretions is also not advisable, but it really helps in making the patient more comfortable and avoiding suction. The next, uh, uh, the next symptom that, and I think the last symptom before I hand over to Rajini is cough. Very often, cough can be a distressing symptom, although it's a protective reflux that we all have. But when it becomes persistent and intractable, it can really affect activities of daily living. And when that happens, again, cough could be not just respiratory, it could be drug-induced, it could be radiation-induced, it could be gastric, it could be ENT, and it could also be cardiac. So evaluation, history taking is important. Once you reach the diagnosis with persistent intractable cough, then there are various treatments that you can start. To begin with, you could start with something topical like lozenges, steam, hot gargles, etc. If you think there is a psychogenic component, you can add either benzodiazepines or SSRIs, but morphine, codeine, as well as gabapentin have worked a lot in intractable cough, especially interstitial lung disease cough, where patients continuously cough and then end up being breathless or desaturating, codeine helps the sera, which also causes constipation, so should be used with laxatives, along with the, or the next step could be morphine and intractable cough can also, there is, has been reports by using gabapentin, start at 100 milligrams at night and then increase it to 300 to 600 milligrams that can be used. If you have a drug induced cough due to ACE inhibitors, the naclofen is a drug that can be used to uh, treat the cough. So I'll hand over now to Rajni, who's going to talk on a couple of more uh, um, symptoms and then talk about COVID and what has happened to us uh, as pulmonologists. And if there's any questions, we'll take it to the, at the end uh, of this session or end of uh, the case presentation. Rajni? Is my screen visible to everyone? Yeah, I think you yes, need to advance. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I just I just kept it at the same slide where you left off, Rajan, so that we could have continuity on that. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajan. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll take up from here, going on from cough onto a few other symptoms, which sometimes require some interventions in order to alleviate uh, the distress caused by those symptoms. Um, and I'd like to add that there's another thing that we also use for intractable cough, and uh, and that is uh, speech and swallow therapy. So we found that for some patients with uh, ILD, there also is a uh, psychogenic element to that cough and speech and swallow therapy can also be useful in, in helping alleviate that intractable uh, you know, cough that goes on day and night for those patients. Um, moving on, um, we'll move on to some of the symptoms that we see in uh, either patients with pulmonary conditions leading to pleural effusion or in patients with chronic um, end, organ, um, end organ disease like chronic liver disease or chronic kidney disease or congestive heart failure leading to pleural effusions. So this can be a very distressing symptom for patients. And if it's an acute situation, then of course we go ahead, aspirate and carry out the diagnosis. And in most situations that one act is good enough to find the diagnosis and then figure out the therapeutic pathway. But it becomes problematic when you have patients with recurrent pleural effusions or very large pleural effusions. And in this situation, when you have a patient with a malignancy, with a very large pleural effusion, then it's important that we figure out the prognostication before we make a treatment plan for the patient. And there are many options that are available to us now. So if it is that the patient's pro uh, prognosis is not going to be 
be one of where there's anticipated survival beyond one month, then one must weigh the options and offer either an aspiration or if it is appropriate, even an intrapural catheter may be offered if that allows the patient to go home and sustain the symptom relief. When we have a longer prognosis, then we have more options of placing in an intercostal drainage and offering um, a, a pleurodesis or again, the option of an intrapleural catheter. When a patient has prognosis and good performance status. And it's also the fact that we, we think that by draining the pleural effusion completely, we will be able to help the patient get to their uh, definitive uh, treatment for their cancer sooner than we also offer thoracoscopy with a talc pleurodesis. Uh, for recurrent pleural effusions of a non-malignant nature also, intrapleural catheters have been used. The caveat there being that intrapleural catheters uh, come with the risk of long, when, when, when we keep long-term indwelling intrapleural catheters, then we have an issue with uh, the possibility of infection. Thank you for the reminder to show the full screen. Uh, so these are the kind of things that we have available to us. And you look at a patient with a massive pleural effusion. So the options would either be to place an intercostal drain for an effusion like this to relieve the dyspnea, or the option would be to place an inter, in, intrapleural catheter which can then be drained by a, an evacuated bottle that allows the patient to go home. Yes, this is expensive. So one has to think about the cost for the patient. Um, the bottles, uh, there is a cost to the initial catheter and there is a cost to the bottles. And once the patients go home with the bottles, they can choose to drain every other day or once in three days or at least once in a week. What has been noted with an intrapleural catheter is that by its mechanical irritation in the pleural space, it induces a pleurodesis so that the surface is fused together. And then we can eventually take the intrapleural catheter out. The other advantage with an intrapleural catheter, as opposed to an intercostal drain, is that it reduces the length of stay for the patient. Because when we put in an intercostal drain, a chest tube, and then put in a talc slurry for, for pleurodesis, Sometimes it can take three days, five days, seven days before the drainage comes down adequately that we can take the drain out and have the patient go home. However, with an intrapleural catheter, I can even do it as an outpatient procedure or send the patient out on the very next day. So it reduces the length of stay in the hospital and we are able to teach the patients and the caregivers how to use it at home uh, rather simply. So if cost is not a constraint, an intrapleural catheter is a very good option for pleural effusions. Now the distressing symptom is hemoptysis. We see that in any kind of malignancy which invades into the airway. Um, and also we see it in uh, infectious diseases such as pulmonary aspergillosis or tuberculosis where patients do present with hemoptysis. So it's basically if it is small volume and self-limiting, then it's not very distressing. And what we can use for that is cough suppression. So you can use codeine formulations in order to, um, in order to suppress the cough and address the primary problem that's there. So if I have a patient who has an infectious etiology of hemoptysis, I give cough suppression to suppress the cough and further expectoration and the antibiotic treatment or the anti-tuberculous treatment as appropriate in order to uh, treat the underlying condition. The main issue becomes when you have a larger volume of hemoptysis. Now we have to keep in mind that the airway requires very little blood to get flooded. So as much as 50 or 100 ml of blood is enough to completely drown out one of our large bronchi. And that, that's where the problem happens. It happens because of, as Dr. Rajam has mentioned on this slide, it's, it's because of asphyxiation and not exsanguination. It's rare that we will have patients exsanguinating with very large, the kind of arterial bleeds that you see in other kinds of malignancies is not what we see. But a small amount of blood, which is flooding the airways, is enough to make a patient hypoxic and become life-threatening. Um, so there are certain interventions that are available for this. Uh, the simple practice that we have is that if you know which side the lesion is on, if you know that the patient has a tumor or a cavity on the right side, for example, then you would ask the patient, you would place the patient in a right side down position so that the airway remains as open and it doesn't spill over into the good lung or the left lung over here. So whichever side is the affected side, the affected side goes down, we give cough suppression, and the basic resuscitative measures of making sure that the blood pressure is maintained and oxygen is maintained. If it's a large volume of hemoptysis, then these patients may require interventions like bronchial artery embolization, and there are bronchoscopic procedures that are available as well 
Um, so we put in certain devices to occlude the area and bias time and make sure that the blood doesn't spill over onto the other side. And this is not something that's, uh, um, you know, sometimes one wonders how far does one go with interventions in a patient who has a limited prognosis? But this is, a, this, is, this is extremely useful in terms of reducing the most distressing symptom of, if you can imagine the distress of a patient who's having blood that they're coughing up with every, in every few breaths that they're coughing up blood. This relieves that distress. It allows the patient to go home and spend the last of their days at home. And, and, and one piece that I learned in my palliative medicine training, which I must admit I did not learn in all my years of pulmonary medicine training is the is, is the simple act of thinking of the distress that a patient goes through seeing these large amounts of blood that they're coughing up um, and that's by using dark sheets so if we just use dark sheets as the bed linen for a patient who's admitted with hemoptysis we will reduce the anxiety and distress that is caused to the patient by seeing the blood that's coughed up that's sometimes soiling their bed linen another extremely distressing symptom that we encounter in patients with advanced malignancies that affect the airway is stridor or critical airway obstruction. These patients can be treated with mechanical devices, airway stents, which are placed in by interventional pulmonologists. And it is, uh, uh, there have been a large number of studies which show that when a patient appears to be in greater dyspnea and seems to be more significantly sick because of a critical airway obstruction, that is actually the patient who has the greatest benefit in quality of life by performing an airway procedure of tumor debulking with rigid bronchoscopy or placement of an airway stent. So very often, this is a miscalculation that we make in our mind. We think a patient is extremely sick. They have an 80% obstruction. And how would this patient go through any procedure? But if the rest of their organ systems are fine, this is the patient who is likely to have the maximum benefit from a tumor debulking and an airway stenting procedure in being able to get discharged home, have the greatest relief of symptoms and have some, some maintained quality of life. So I have a number of patients who have had airway procedures for critical airway obstruction, um, especially for benign airway obstruction. Um, we think that interventional pulmonology procedures are a good option if surgery is not an option because it allows the patient a much better quality of life rather than having a tracheostomy, placing an airway stent or a Montgomery T tube is good in terms of the body image of the patient, preserving speech function. So these are the things we keep in mind when we're dealing with patients with airway obstruction. It's not just the breathing, but it's also voice quality and the body image of the patient here. And coming finally to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to what is on everyone's mind, and which is COVID. Uh, there have been many advances in the treatment of COVID between one year and, and more since the world has been reeling under the effects of the pandemic. Um, and while the virus itself has undergone changes and there are variants of concern and there have been certain changes in the, in the symptomatology and the transmission and as well as and the morbidity and mortality due to the disease, the majority of patients do recover with a full functional recovery. We know that the majority of patients are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. Some of them will have moderate symptoms. The majority of patients with moderate disease will recover completely with a full functional recovery. A small percentage of them may end up experiencing long COVID as well, but the majority will do well. The problem comes in those patients who have moderate to severe COVID-19. They may have a limitation of lung function following resolution of the infection. And what do we see that expressed as? We might see that as a patient who has oxygen requirements even on discharge. So they may have a requirement for home supplemental oxygen. Some of them have low-grade fevers and hypoxia. If they have a dip in their oxygen level, that's when we scan and see, is there a pattern of organizing pneumonia, which is an inflammatory post-viral infection response? This responds typically to steroids, which we start off initially in the standard doses of 0.5 milligrams per kg and quickly taper down to the lowest dose necessary to make sure that the patient is as close to normoxic as possible. Another thing that we've noticed as sequelae is that patients will end up developing bronchiectasis or fibrosis in the areas of the lung that were most affected. So if it was ground glass opacities, they typically will resolve well. But if that goes on to dense consolidation and cavitation, these are patients, patients who have had secondary bacterial infections and prolonged ICU stays. These are patients who may have some limitation of lung function. So I think it's very, very important that we address their breathlessness as well as the potential for reduction of lung function with early referral to pulmonary rehab. 
we have to keep in mind that patients with covid who are being sent and home on uh, will have a great degree of anxiety so these are patients who will need uh, more uh, uh, will high touch regular contact patients to monitor their progress so it's always good to have the patient be connected to the physiotherapist or to their uh, primary physician and have regular follow up with the pulmonologist for their reassurance so many places have started doing post covid clinics to keep a close watch on these patients a small percentage of patients with severe covid 19 who require prolonged ventilation may end up requiring very prolonged ventilation may find ventilation inadequate and may require extra corporeal membrane oxygenation and may need lung transplant now we wonder what is the role of palliative medicine in this and it is that the numbers are rising so much that there are many patients who will not end up receiving organs as dr rajam ayer mentioned to you lung transplant is still in its nascent stages in india yes we're doing really well especially the southern states are doing well in it but there is a limit to the resources that we have we have seen institutions run out of resources for ecmo we have seen our country reel under an oxygen deficit in many many cases and what has been extremely distressing to most of us in the palliative medicine community is the fact that the opioid hesitancy that dr rajam ayer spoke of which means that some of our patients who have been in breathless of covid have not really received the adequate amount of opioids or benzodiazepines to alleviate their breathlessness so palliative medicine approach to a patient with severe or long covid goes a long, long way in making sure that their symptoms are addressed as best as possible the very critical role will be in defining goals of care providing support to the family in this situation as well we've seen a glut of over investigation and over medication and polypharmacy i forgot to add one point over here but i will say that routine ct i've seen patients getting ct chest done at every two week interval and what that does to the patient is it adds to their anxiety the patient comes to us saying that my score was 13 on 25 and it is still 13 on 25 two weeks later or four weeks later well i don't expect it to change not for six weeks eight weeks 12 weeks maybe even six months we have had the experience of h1n1 pneumonia with severe ards we know that it may take 6 to 12 uh, it may take up to 6 months for the radiological symptoms to resolve and the patient may be left with a scar but not all of these patients will require steroids and most certainly they do not require anti fibrotics there is no evidence base for prescribing routine anti fibrotics to patients who have any sign of fibrosis on their ct scans at discharge i have seen over prescription of anti fibrotics in a way that the first ct did not mention the word bronchiectasis or bands of fibrosis but if the second ct scan just has a mention of the word traction bronchiectasis or fibrosis and an intended neboroprofenadone is added on we got i mean we've seen enough fibrosis and bronchiectasis with tuberculosis we don't treat that with an anti fibrotic post covid fibrosis again the focus of treatment here will be the breathing thinking functioning model pulmonary rehab psychosocial support helping the patient make a full functional recovery low dose steroids as and when indicated if there is organizing pneumonia or signs of persisting inflammation and of course we have this nebulous symptoms of long covid which we are still grappling with we're trying to figure out which are the patients who are more prone to it it's been a very difficult one to tease out because there are some patients with mild covid too who end up having prolonged symptoms going on for 6 to 12 weeks after resolution of their covid infection this includes things like persisting fatigue a difficulty in concentration patients say they're not able to go back to work and perform at full strength vague symptoms now these are symptoms which they cannot quantify and they sometimes even feel ashamed to bring it up that i am i should feel grateful that i'm i'm well and back home but they really not feeling 100% so a lot of these are addressed just by addressing each of these symptoms as a symptom complex figure out what are the symptoms and what best are the measures at the moment that's that's a field which palliative medicine has maximum experience in and learning how to address the symptoms with the you know medicate the least and first do no harm would be the idea what has been found useful for patients with prolonged low grade fevers or mild joint pains that are persisting is the use of uh, certain non steroidal anti inflammatories for short courses have been useful uh, for some patients who have persistent pains uh, a depot injection of steroids has been found useful in a similar way like post viral arthralgias are treated for other diseases as well so that's a very small percentage of patients uh, they do require psychosocial support we must be mindful of the fact that up to 
treatment of pain recovered from COVID will experience some mental health disturbances in the period three to six months after resolution of their COVID. So being aware of the fact allows us to reassure the patient and refer them for either pharmacological or non-pharmacological treatment for the anxiety or the depression or the obsessive thoughts that can come up after recovery from COVID. And with that, uh, we come to a close of our discussion about uh, the various aspects uh, where respiratory symptoms need to be addressed uh, by palliative medicine. I see uh, Dr. Rajam and Dr. Rajani, they've already answered the questions in the chat box. So uh, do we have any more questions from the participants? Dr. Sashidharan or Dr. Bharat Paliwal, anyone? I think maybe just in case people have not looked at the chat box, should we, uh, Dr. Rajam, do you think we can do a quick uh, summary of some of the, small, uh, some of the more uh, important questions that we would like to highlight? Sure. Does Gauria want to have a look at that? And is there something that uh, Dr. Punita or Dr. Anne want to add? Please go ahead at this time and um, then we can do the case. So I want to give Rajini a shout out to Dr. Punita. Dr. Punita and I are, are classmates from a long time ago and it's wonderful to see, um, you know, my, uh, my dearest friend from across the continent, from across the oceans on this call. Yeah, same here. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, add one thing that, you know, over here, we use the board index quite uh, frequently to predict mortality in patients with COPD, and we find it like really, really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, uh, Dr. Rajam and Dr. Rajni for your wonderful, wonderful, comprehensive, uh, you know, talk about dyspnea and uh, palliative care in, in respiratory issues. Thank you. But you know, Punita, one thing I want to have, I think where, uh, you know, when you talk about the way you work in the US, it's very different here. I think we still try to convince the respiratory physicians to think of us, you know, when the patient yeah. is like having three admissions in a year, this still doesn't occur to them. So, you know, we also see patients, uh, Rajni will agree either two hours before intubation <laughs> or two weeks before death. So there is really no time to form a rapo, and you know the patient is real clearly very very advanced. So I think the focus here was a recognition when they're going downhill, and to convince their colleagues at work that you know we are not going to take away um, your inputs. Uh, again, thinking of the fact that 80% of our practice is private. So if a patient is going to go away to a palliative care physician, it is that income gone for the private consultant. So it has to be treaded very carefully saying, I'm not here to take away your practice. I'm only here to enhance your practice and thereby improving the patient's quality of life. You know, I'm just because I spend a lot of time, it's very sad that the patient thinks the busy consultant who is a pulmonologist gives me five minutes while this lady gives me 50. I'd rather go to this lady. I don't want that because even the few patients who will come will stop coming. So it has to be, you know, very dangerously treaded. At the same time, I think word of mouth is what gets us more patients. Patients send us more patients instead of doctors referring more and more. And I think in the past four years, I've probably managed to convert maybe half a dozen consultants only in my hospital. So it's a long time because they, they actually say things like, oh, you're giving up on the patient. Oh, but he's not end of life. So, you know, so there is a huge mind gap and we need a paradigm shift in the consultant. So the more we talk, that we are not here to you know, take away your practice. We are here to focus on patient's quality of life. I think, you know, but yes, the board index is something we've read about, but we don't get much to apply. We are still struggling uh, probably 20 years from before from where you are. So uh, a long road for us. Oh, very I well totally said. agree with what, yeah, what you are mentioning. And we, you know, we've been encountering similar challenges. I mean, in cancer diagnosis, we are, you know, still able to get involved pretty uh, quickly and, uh, and in a very, you know, acceptable manner. Whereas in, in issues like uh, COPD or, you know, lung issues or cardiac issues, you know, that acceptance is still like, it's treading at a very snail place. So, you know, it's happening, it's gaining momentum, but not as fast as, as cancer patients. So the struggles are similar. True. 
but here the misconception punita is it's only for cancer i've had yes, friends yeah. of mine saying oh so you're looking only after cancer patients now so i have to then start my whole spiel of what is palliative care so it's yeah. uh, it's a bit it, uh, it's very different here and having seen how it works in uk and us i realize that you know here we have to start from where you were 20 years ago so i think we will yeah. get there eventually there's some question here uh, about um, morphine can be given 4 hourly in breathlessness yes we can give but we never go bio it's not that unlike pain there is a ceiling dose for morphine in breathlessness and we increase it very very gradually and while increasing we also need to explore other causes that is contributing to breathlessness so if the patient is already on morphine and still experiencing breathlessness then we need to explore uh, anxiety frustration depression etc or if the patient doesn't not everybody benefits from morphine then we need to think of other things and i think one of the things that can benefit is also methadone which dr ann will talk at the end of it i think there's already a examination or uh, some uh, tutorial on that so i think that also can make a difference depending on the receptor availability there are some patients who do not benefit with morphine i didn't think that was a purview of this talk but when the patient is already on morphine and still experiencing you need to explore other issues that is contributing to the breathlessness um i'm just going to address one question that came up in the chat which was about resistance training um i think it's very important to understand that our approach to pulmonary rehab and physiotherapy when we're looking at it from the lens of palliative pulmonology is one where we will constantly have a shift back and forth about whether the focus of our rehab is strengthening functioning or symptom control the same training actually can be used in different varying intensities so we are going to be teaching the patient breathing techniques we're going to teach them the kind of um the kind of ways that they can control their automatic thoughts which send them into cycles of anticipatory breathlessness we are going to teach them uh, exercises which are physical exercises and that includes resistance training now you might initially start off when a patient is early on in the disease with a much more um, aggressive program of resistance training when my goal is to make sure that my patient is ambulating on their own that they are able to get out and about and attend to their activities and be completely independent in their activities of daily living as the disease progresses i might shift the focus of the physiotherapy to make sure that okay now my focus is going to be purely symptom management so as the as the disease progresses as my patient's life shrinks if their oxygen requirement is already at 5 to 6 liters per minute at home now this patient i i will not be my the focus my resistance training will come down to just what is necessary to make sure that they are able to do things that matter to them like going to the bathroom and maintain dignity on that count so your resistance training will depend on whether your focus is on improved functional capacity or more on symptom management again depending on where we are in the disease trajectory of that patient one last question if i may take before we move on to the case is about role of family physician in palliative care and i think they are the backbone in this country they are a uh, few and far to find now they are becoming lesser and lesser because everybody wants to be a specialist uh, having said that when i discharge a patient from the hospital and i know this patient will need palliative care discussions and difficult dialogues goals of care i see to it that the family physician is involved prior to the discharge because that person takes palliative care to the patient's home of course covid has changed that a bit yet the family physician is also the one who knows the family dynamics the person who's emotional the person who has the purse strings the person who needs to be handled with care the person who's the decision maker the family physician knows the family way better than i do because i see the patient uh, in the hospital in an acute setting so when the patient goes home there is trust between uh, on what i am saying because i'm routing it through the family physician so i think the family physician is extremely important i think all family physicians need basic training in palliative care i think they all need to see to it that they can communicate to families about when to withhold care when not to escalate care talk to them when there is time and not in an acute 
good setting and that is best done by family physicians so i cannot emphasize the important role enough of family physicians we need them we need to be need to train them in palliative care also so they can do a lot at home plus they can select patients before they get admitted to hospitals and admit hospitals uh, patients to hospital with goals of care so there's no confusion to the patient to the family and to the treating consultant especially in a resource crunch country like india we cannot treat 90 year olds and 19 year olds in the same manner we cannot put all 90 year olds on the ventilator and ideally we shouldn't it's not it's not the way to do it so that i think that difference the family physician can do uh, thank you Raja, thank my, you ma'am uh, yeah hello uh, right uh, i'm sorry yeah. to interrupt uh, uh, we can Rajam, uh, take can the I... we can take the questions after we have the case presentation because we are already like running slightly late uh, we can take all the questions after we have this case uh, dr manu can i uh, request you to um, start your presentation yeah. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Your line is a little unclear. Okay. So maybe probably maybe due to the rains here. Your voice is breaking. Okay. Am I audible now? No, it's still breaking. Is it okay now? Uh, sir, can you change your microphone position? Yeah, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Our case for presentation today is uh, regarding palliative care for respiratory diseases. And today, uh, next slide, next slide, please. Okay, today we have an 82-year-old male with a diagnosis of uh, COPD, carcinoma piriform sinus post-treatment, carcinoma esophagus that too post-treatment, and now carcinoma lung since uh, 2000 May, 2020 May. Now having disease progression, hypercalcemia and aspiration pneumonia. Uh, Mansar, Mansar, uh, Mansar, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, are you using a head, head, headset or a headphone? Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir, you can continue. What your voice okay. is using, okay, sir? Okay, okay. Next slide, please. So he presented with breathing difficulty of one week and pain over uh, right nose and left side, chest wall for the last one week. He had cough with uh, white spirit the past two weeks. He has uh, throat secretions past one day and dulcimus for past one day and has history of difficulties following the past two days. Next slide, please. So he, regarding his recent malignancy, the carcinoma lung, he has the polydifferentiated carcinoma cell carcinoma. He underwent multiple lines chemotherapy as well as radiation. And uh, he has history of desaturation right at home. And uh, now, uh, and he's uh, test COVID negative. Next slide, please. On examination, found that he's having performance status of four and temperature 97.2, pulse rate 84 per minute, respiratory rate of 23, blood pressure of uh, 110 over 80, uh, saturation 96 percentage, the patient was emaciated, and he had reduced air entry on the right side with the crepitations and uh, there was a swelling which was tendered on the right chest wall. These other system examinations were within normal limits. Next slide, please. So regarding uh, treatment and significant investigations, uh, according to the PET scan taken one year back, last 2020, he showed uh, no uptake in his uh, earlier malignancy areas. The platform sinus and his virus was free, but he had a right lung lesion with a rib involvement. And broken biopsy from the lung showed poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, so uh, the recent CT scan uh, in February 2021 that showed progressive disease with two lesions in right lung with rib destruction, chest wall extension, hepatic extension. And he had right pleural, uh, positive pleural deposits with mild uh, and right 
Mike Torley fish. Is that in the stations the relevant ones were uh, uh, calcium was 12.7, so in hypercalcemia. The total count also was on the uh, slightly higher side. And we have submitted uh, under the medical oncologist uh, on 25th of May, later shifted to palliative oncology. We have started on uh, injection calcitone in hydrocode, uh, levoflux, uh, telephilin, uh, pantoprostone, and stabilization. And uh, we have started on a morphine tablet, 5 mg, 8th only. And criminal legs. Later on, I guess shift uh, changed to the medicine was changed to injection morphine and IV fluids. That was started in view of chest pains and dyspnea and inability to take oral morphine. Next slide, please. So, regarding the psychosocial aspects, he has a son and daughter who are well settled. He's an ex army person. He is getting the benefits for treatment. His wife has a psychiatric illness for the past 25 years. Uh, he was supporting his wife, and now he's concerned what will happen to her after his death. So he had a positive approach during early malignancies, but now he's desperate and knows that he has a bad disease. Yet uh, he wants to live longer if possible. And uh, another problem was he wanted to take oral feeds, but not able to do so because of uh, cough. He was given the option of high uh, tube feeds, but again he is not uh, uh, not much keen on that. Uh, uh, right stream insertion and feeds. Next slide, please. Some medications which he has received earlier, uh, like in the last admission one month back, that was some morphine, that was and what we were seeing on the left side. Uh, he had multiple medications. Uh, he has an honorary inhaler also. Uh, but after admitting uh, on our side this time, uh, his medications. Uh, later changed to injection. Like uh, before that, uh, he presented with the drowsiness. He has earlier on uh, morphine tell me fourth early. So after admission, morphine was stopped for one or two days. And again, he, he was alert and he was having pain, dyspnea. So initially, we started on a low dose of morphine, five milligram, that was uh, eight early. Uh, he had a uh, uh, symptom, he was slightly like better with that. And pain was also controlled. Okay, anyway, he had a broad secretion, so injection uh, like a pilot was initiated. And uh, he was given debilitation with uh, the and never sadly the work. Initially, during the last admissions, he was not comfortable with the nebulizations. He was only together, but this time, he felt he was slightly better with the nebulizations, and he had tolerated it well. So we continued with the nebulization. And, he, and on admission, he had a kidney with throat suction, and later on, it was stopped because the uh, throat was clear. Huh? And continuing his difficulty in feeding, he was uh, started on IV tools. And uh, he had fever on the second day of admission. So initially, he started on liver processing. And uh, he responded well for five, six days. Uh, later on, uh, he had to, uh, he, he insisted on uh, taking oral liquids. So somehow he started again having fever. And counts were also going high. So he, he was changed to uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, cyclopatazone, so like that. He was also put on hydrocortisone, and uh, injection calcitone was given to bring down his calcium that was stopped after the calcium levels were normalized. Next slide, please. This so, is being concerned by the poor, intake, poor oral intake, and uh, his complaint was uh, dyspnea or pains when motion was stopped. And the main concern was. Then maybe that was that's one of the main concerns that he had. He was uh, worried about his wife's mental health and who, uh, the support system she's going to get in the future. And that he's having now third primary malignancy, third time. So that was, uh, these were his main concerns. Next slide, please. In summary, he has an 82 year old exami person who had a COPD and triple malignancy, uh, two malignancy treated earlier. Now with carcinoma language, lot will be uh, given chemotherapy two lines, uh, radiation, monochrome antibody, still having disease progression. Now with hypercalcemia for end of life care. He has concerns of his wife's mental health and her future. His, uh, his physical symptoms were taken care of, but he's deteriorating and nearing the end of life. He expired in the hospital room uh, three days back. Next slide. So, uh, the question points, like, like one, I guess, aware of two cancers, now he's having third primary, 
with uh, progressive disease. Uh, we usually call, call it uh, field cancerization. He had pyrifold uh, uh, so malignancy and esophagus and now CLM. So he's having a field cancerization. And uh, he's concerned of his wife's future. And now the, the hypercalcemia initially settled, but uh, nearing his end of life, uh, he again started having hypercalcemia. So whether to treat it or not, that was the question. And uh, uh, dyspnea care, regarding his dyspnea care, whether, whether, uh, whether stepping up or increasing dose of morphine made him drowsy, that was a question. So we had to, uh, so uh, we had to uh, yeah, titrate the dose, adjust the dose. And regarding oral fees, he, he didn't want to have an issue fee, but at the same time, he wants to take something. So we had to. Uh, Arrange like like arrange arrange to make him feel in the same position or more of liquids or whatever he is he is able to tolerate. And regarding antibiotics, also he though he was in the end of his life, still we had to uh, put in uh, antibiotics that are giving because of his fever and increasing counts. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Manu. Uh, just for those people who couldn't hear, uh, like Dr. Ann and Hari Mohan have said, the slides were very clear. And just to recap, this was an 82-year-old gentleman who had survived two cancers and now had a poorly differentiated carcinoma of the lung with an underlying COPD. And this is, he has been uh, has had a lot of treatment done in the past. Issues here, like I said, in the uh, were that he's 82 with two cancers in the past and an incurable advanced COPD, which is requiring, uh, and, and a lung cancer, which is probably very advanced. So this was the first point that I tried to say that 82 with two previous cancers, and yet there hasn't been discussions of goals of care and the fact that what could the future hold? It is very important for us doctors to start having these discussions early. Then this whole, it's not that he's going to worry about his wife less. Uh, Arun, if we can go to the uh, question discussion page, please, slide, please. So it's not that his, his, uh, his uh, concern for his wife's future will become less, but at least we, if we have addressed it and acknowledged it and gave, given him plans that a, we can do one, two, three, four, five for her, that would have made him at least die peacefully. So I think important is the timing of conversation, the when you have these difficult dialogues, especially if it's an 82 year old with COPD, with cancer, with previous cancer, there are enough comorbidities to start the discussion early. And this is where our training in medical school needs to have palliative care training so that we, when we step out of MBBS, we know when to initiate uh, uh, the treatment. Uh, I mean, the discussions. Uh, second thing, I think the number of medications he was on was a huge list. And that's exactly what somebody else had com com commented also. There has to be rationalization of medication, especially if you know you're going to go through a palliative line of treatment. Uh, third thing about treating certain conditions like hypercalcemia, whether to treat, not to treat. So the whole ethos in palliative care is treat everything that has symptoms. Whatever the symptoms has, you have to try to correct the correctables, reverse it. And if it's causing any distressing symptom, please treat the patient. Similarly for antibiotics. Now, if the patient has been explained that the antibiotics is only going to curb the infection, but not prevent the aspiration, then there are patients who decide that I don't want any more IV, further IV lines. It has to, it's a lot is dependent on communication. A lot is dependent on how much time you have for the patient. And then if you aggressively treat the patient's infection with paracetamol, because the fever is what bothers them. The cough is what bothers them. The breathlessness is what bothers them. So if you treat symptoms aggressively, you don't have to almost, you don't have to then always prod patients and give IV antibiotics. So it has to be in the, in the context of palliative care. What we then are trying to tell you is early identification of patients who will require it. Start talking to the patients of difficult dialogues. Uh, when you address goals of care, document it properly that if you have this, we will give you this, we will give you this. We won't investigate whether the patient wants to go to hospital or no. So we need to have a person-centered care. It has to be a shared decision-making, which is in his best interest and causing him least harm. This is what I would say. Rajni, you want to add to that? And Arun, if you can, we can stop screen sharing.
Uh, no, thank you for covering so many of the points uh, that are relevant to this case, Rajam. And yes, I think we've all seen this in our practice when we have uh, received patients uh, who have not had the, um, uh, the appropriate conversations done before. Uh, and I do think that it's important to address, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I was about to bring up the issue of antibiotics and, you know, you brought it up, Anne, but uh, there's actually something to be said about uh, looking at a situation like this and seeing where can I reduce the burden, even in terms of medications, um, and where can we try and make sure that we're actually able to address the patient's concerns. Now, if it is a situation situation that they do and rice tube and things like that. Sometimes we've we've done this where we think if that's if the new if sustaining the nutrition with the rice tube is important. One of the arguments we give to patients is you can have a rice tube to maintain the nutritional um, requirement, but also allow for some amount of um, small feeds for tails because that is a joy and a pleasure. And if we are able to do that with a low risk of aspiration with an assessment about that. Um, that's one way of at least giving them that pleasure of taste. Um, in terms of, uh, um, uh, I think that was one of the things that I wanted to address. And uh, about the pain, another part is depending on the location of the pain and the involvement of um, segmental or intercostal nerves, there are certain blocks that can be attempted to reduce the pain drastically. That would also allow you to type it uh, down your requirement of other medications. If it's, that's another possibility. So I think there's a question here from Hari Mohan that a fever, dyspnea, and a small extent of corn, cough can come down with antibiotics. Why not uh, try that? It's mm -hmm. we are not saying no to antibiotics. It has to be a uh, gauged in that particular context and individualized. So suppose the patient has been on one, two, three antibiotics, then another fourth really doesn't make sense. Second thing, if it's invasive, patient doesn't have lines. Uh, it's difficult to administer the antibiotics, then you need to weigh the benefits and risks of giving that antibiotic. Third, antibiotic is not all um, hunky-dory. I mean, patients can get severe side effects to him. So even if he's eating one more morsel of food, which is important for him and his family, even that might stop with nausea, vomitings, ulcers, whatever. So you need, it has to be individualized. It has to be shared and it is not a, it's not black and white. Medicine is not black and white. We have to find a middle path, which is beneficial for me, for patients and caregivers. So it's a win-win for everybody. Yes, the patient is critical. We will lose him, but it should be in, on his terms in comfort and dignity and respect that he deserves. So it that's why it takes a little bit more time. It's not like dishing out prescriptions that we do for COPD for all patients. The inhalers remain the same. Everything remains the same. But in palliative care, the approach is different. Do you Are you okay taking these inhalers? Are you happy? Do you have side effects? Can we do something else? So I think that is what we are saying. We are not bashing up antibiotics it is depending on the context and if the patient is getting recurrent aspiration pneumonia then how long are you going to give the antibiotics then maybe it makes more sense to see get the speech therapy involved not see to it that he doesn't eat orally or see to it that he can eat some solid foods and then see treat the aspiration pneumonia differently by giving supportive treatment like morphine like oxygen like fever, or treat the paracetamol. So it's not that we are bashing up antibiotics, but we need to use it judiciously and we need to see what it's doing to our patient. And would you like to come in? Yep. Yeah, Harimon, sorry. Uh, I, would, I, don't I, I never I intended uh, that you're bashing antibiotics, no. <laughs> I just think that let's not have any anathema or anything. Ultimate aim is the end the good uh, comfort of the patient. We all know as palliative care physicians, that's the end we look. Not thinking hey, this I, is going to help. I am going to give it. It's not because in being in palliative care, I'm not going to have any, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not going to give continuous IV antibiotic in the higher end. But if there is an obvious infection, which oh, if reduced can help him, there is yeah, I, I don't think anybody disagrees with you that the use of antibiotics for uh, treatment or to complete a treatment course, but I think sometimes um, we treat ourselves by giving continuous yeah. antibiotics um, and with, uh, at least in the U.S., um, disastrous side effects with an increase in C. difficile um, uh, rates. Um, so 
uh, we don't add to dignity if patients end up having uh, oh, yeah. a, a, a kind of diarrhea that restricts entry into their room, et cetera. Um, so I, I think it's a conversation just as you uh, describe. If we feel that antibiotics are going to reverse their breathlessness and cough uh, and difficulty breathing, I think that's appropriate. It's just the um, uh, ongoing throwing antibiotics at a, at a uh, body that is uh, now in the dying phase and we're better off helping families. I've also seen the uh, fluid overload of intravenous antibiotics increase breathlessness. So just some unintended consequences that I know you know, that all of us know. Um, but just a reminder, and I think families do very well with this conversation. They, they um, uh, it takes longer than 10 minutes. It's more of the 50 minute one, um, but it does, uh, does relieve families that we aren't going to allow them to uh, suffer. So obviously uh, no one answer for every patient. Uh, thank, thank you, you uh, uh, sorry uh, the one dilemma which usually happens is that uh, uh, patient with uh, reserved lung volume uh, has inability to cough and despite physiotherapy the secretions keeps on panting up and secondarily in secondary infections keeps on putting uh, on so we treat with the antibiotics uh, again. Uh, some uh, the fever comes down for a few days, and again it, it starts. You uh, we again send for, for some cultures. Some other organism grows. Again we start something, and we when we ask the primary uh, physician regarding the prognosis of the disease, he says that okay, if you treat the infection, he may live for six months, or he may live for six. So again. Uh, Hearing this statement, uh, family members are convinced that you please be aggressive on your antibiotics. On the one end, the patient is who is not even willing to take orally any food. Uh, there is a bunch of antibiotics going on on the request of uh, patient uh, family. So uh, this is one a dilemma which is faced. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Also, to just to quickly uh, address that, I think again it goes back. To starting with communication. If the patient and the family are explained exactly how the antibiotics will benefit and how, how not, then we leave it to them to decide and then we do exactly what they will want us to do. Second thing, I think in such patients who are so frail and bed bound, one thing we forget is hydration and even postural drainage helps in draining out secretions because patients are so scared to drink water and then they have to go to the the toilet and they have to get up and everything is like a climbing the Everest. We they drink less and less. So hydration, saline nebulizations, they might not be able to bring out the cough, but simple things like postural drainage, these things help. But I think in all this, it might not be a hundred percent solution. Therefore, communicating to the patient and the family the exact clinical status of the patient that we can and achieve, but it will not be hundred percent. We will try, but it might not be. I don't have a magic wand to make it all go but there are other things to do and i think once you tr tr tell them twice you tell them they get more and more seasoned to listening that this man is not going to be then their attitude changes it will not happen in a night and it will not happen in a co in one conversation which is why i think uh, we all need to keep trying our best to try and explain the clinical situation once that goes in then the patients and the family are able to decide so i think hydration Postural drainage, nebulization also helps in preventing stagnation. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Ann, would you like to uh, comment uh, regarding methadone? Um, uh, good evening, everybody. I feel a little bit like a broken record um, asking people to do their order there. Every, those of you who have your camera on are smiling, so that's good. Um, Please, um, uh, so far we still just have 11 out of 44 of you who have done their uh, methadone sets. Um, if you're having difficulty, we'll, we'll be uh, writing all of you to encourage you to do this. Um, I think I'd like to 
think of this as a national uh, uh, initiative to see if methadone might be used uh, more frequently if people uh, had training. So think of yourselves as the, um, the pioneers and the game changers for India in getting um, that order set done. I know some of you, so I will start writing uh, you all personally <laughs> to encourage you to do this. And I might actually get some of the professors to do it as well, um, including Dr. Raj. So uh, kidding aside, please, um, if you don't have the order set, if it's gone into your delete file, um, no worries, no embarrassment. Please just write Dr. Uh, Raju or myself and we'll get it out to you again. Um, we do want to respect those people who have already finished it and get them the answers, but we're hoping to wait until at least 50% of you have done the, to, done the cases. So um, just, just me, the broken record uh, from Iowa in the United States. All right, thank you everybody. What a great talk. Uh, thank you for the case, which I, despite the difficulty hearing it, uh, was very uh, well presented in the PowerPoint. Uh, oh, a prize. <laughs> All right, I'll try to figure out a prize uh, from Iowa for the early, the early worm, as Dr. Harriman says. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure meeting all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.